My name is Michael Wilson. My name is Jasmine Scott. My name is Eugenia Dra. Hello everyone. Thank you for clicking this link. Um, what you're about to see are four courageous young ladies who are going to share their story about dealing with mental disorders. Um, you will hear about their struggles, their strengths, their challenges, and their victories. Be encouraged and inspired by what you hear. You are now about to watch. Hi, my name is Michael Wilson. I am 30 years old and I suffer from depression, bipolar, PTSD, anxiety, and panic disorder. Um, I first realized that I was depressed back in, well, when I was little. Um, I always was really sad, and I think that came from just um, my mother being on drugs and me being sexually molested from the age 4 to 12. Um, I stopped being molested when I moved with my father. Um, I was 13 years old, and at that time, I moved with my father, and his wife didn't like me at all. So, of course, I was being mistreated uh, with my father um, and his now wife. Um, they put me out at the age of 17. I graduated um, scholarship. Um, honors and I just went about my my life but at the same time I also was suffering from depression and it was very hard because I just felt like I was alone um, I didn't have anybody at the time so you know I would be sad and just stay to myself um, in 2006 I was actually diagnosed um, with those disorders um, and I was just like scared because I felt like everybody was going to judge me oh she's this crazy person and you know don't mess with her and just a whole bunch of stuff but then I also on the other hand think that people was like oh she's normal she's not crazy she's she's just like everybody else everybody suffer from something um, and I still get that to this day that you know everybody's crazy or everybody suffer from bipolar um, but at the end of the day it's like I feel people don't really understand what we go through um, I feel like a lot of of our disorders are mentally meaning that you physically cannot see what really goes on in our minds um, so I just you know I'm, I'm dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis I am on medication um, and you know that helps for that helps with my bipolar and anxiety but I also have to learn to cope with it um, without medicine also because I one day want to not be on medication I want to you know be able to go out here and work and be out with the population and not think that um, my disorders are going to stop me from that so with that being said I just encourage everybody to stay strong everybody that's going through this like I feel like, you know, you have to be strong and don't worry about what other people say. And as far as myself, I also, I'm also learning that, you know, I have to not worry about what people say because that's one of my biggest fears as far as me going out in public and stuff. I'm always thinking that somebody's going to judge me and stuff like that. So I just say, just be encouraged and it's okay if you suffer from a mental disability disability it's it's okay like everybody suffer from something and ours are just unique and we have to learn that 
everybody's not the same, but it's okay to be or have it's okay to have a mental disability. So I thank you um, for allowing me to share my story and that if I could be an encouragement to anybody, just let me know. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jasmine Scott. Um, I'm 25. And I'm here to tell my story about how someone who has bipolar or schizophrenia can impact their family. My mother, um, she was the head of the house. She always made sure everything was taken care of as far as the rent and food on the table. You know, my dad, he brought money into the house, but she was the one who was to distribute the money and make sure everything ran smoothly. So in 2003, she lost her dad, and that was the first time we saw her mentally break down. Uh, as many assume, you would just think that she's just grieving, so she would spaz out and throw things and just rip her clothes off and cry herself to sleep and pray herself to sleep, and we all just thought, you know, she was just coping with death. Um, months and months after Months and months after the death of my grandfather, I want to say around, he died in the summer of 03, around December in 03, um, we had an eviction notice on our door. And we asked mom, what was that about? She said, um, God revealed to me that the landlord was not doing us right in the house and it's time to move. And it was just not like her character like my mom would always run things past my dad and you know but we just thought maybe you know it was just a higher power just you know God really did reveal it to her it wasn't until the sheriff actually came to our house right after Christmas and told us that we had to leave and I was uh, 13 the first thing I thought to grab was my PlayStation 3 <laughs> and ran out the door and my mom she just you know began to shout with the money in her hand she said I have the money but I won't give it to you because I refuse to let you tear tear us down tear my family apart and it was always as if someone was attacking her um, so my mother she also served as a deaconess at the church and as she served as a deaconess she um, she was able to have the security code to the church. So once we got set out, we were actually able to sleep inside of a church. Now, that was me, my brother, my mother, and my father, a family of four. We were in the church, and after school, we actually would go there, do our homework, and then go in the back and wash up in the bathrooms and sleep on the pews and kind of space out. And it wasn't until another mother in the church actually realized that what we were doing and she welcomed us in to stay at her home. Oh, I must tell you this part. Um, when my mother was this, when she would put the security code in, she actually would let me see it. And it was 316. And I asked my mom, I said, Mom, why is the code 316? She said, it's John 316. For God so loved the earth that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth, believeth in him shall now perish, but shall have everlasting life. And for that moment, everything just made sense to me. And when she took us to church, she said, the Lord will provide. He said, come to his house and you shall be fine. So, I always knew where to get my strength from to deal with this. So um, once we stayed with the mother in the church house, it was like she felt like the lady was talking about her. And my mother would go around talking to herself saying, I know you're talking about me. And the lady never mentioned anything. She always felt attacked. And even when my father would say certain things to her about how she needs to relax, she felt like he was attacking her. And uh, it was an ongoing, we had to constantly move from house to house because my mother would eventually get into it with someone in the household and they would ask us to leave. And uh, finally in 2010, my dad was able to get his own home. Um, he brought my mother in and she was staying with us. And around this time I'm in college and I had to realize that 
um, when you're dealing with someone with bipolar and schizophrenia, there will be times where they just don't understand everything that's going on around, such as um, I had finals, I had times where I was getting my brother ready for school, and she just wouldn't understand what the responsibility I had. She just would feel like it was, you know, it was about her. So she would say, you don't understand, and she would walk around naked, try to jump out in the street naked and while we were at work and it was thank god i had a neighbor that was there and you know caught her before she jumped out in the street but someone who has schizophrenia they hear voices and they always assume that someone is talking about them someone is plotting against them and they don't even know who to trust not even their own family members so once i began working at my job they actually had training for people who dealt with dementia and they kind of had similar traits um, in which they would um, think that someone is attacking them because they will forget who the person is serving them or who is um, taking care of them. So from that moment, um, from the trainer, I learned how to become more nurturing to her disorder and not be so, you got to go to sleep, but mom, would you like to go to sleep? Um, mom, your husband, I don't think you want to keep your husband up all night. And she would be more considerate from that angle versus you just need to lay down. Um, also, once I became, once I got trained on how to deal with it, I began trying to spread, educate my brother and my father how to cope with it. And we learned that we had to operate as a team, make sure she takes her medicine. You know, I have to call her regularly, make sure she take, um, that she has eight. Um, I even bring her to church. My church family loves it when they see her, when they, have, they even have a prayer list here. So when she is down, they send her cards to give her words of encouragement. And it makes a complete difference in her attitude because she realized that other people are out here praying for her and supporting her. So one thing that I would definitely want to say to a young lady who may be dealing with this, um, communication is key. If your family member has like medication it's good to write things down to make sure when the police come or if a family um, um, family member needs help to rec recognize what medication she's on you should have a log that you can kind of put keep track of what medication she's on who's her doctor what's the insurance provider and just have everyone should have access to it in case of emergencies also prayer 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 it makes a complete difference. It keeps you grounded, keeps you sane. It keeps everyone, everyone thinks that you're at peace, but the Lord knows what's going on. He's working it out for you. So prayer keeps me grounded so much. And also, um, love and nurturing. Like, love, like, you can't, like, they can feed off your emotions. They can tell when you're sincere, and they can tell when you're just trying to go to sleep. So I have to realize when to take a moment to stop and breathe and look into our eyes and see what's going on and what I can do to help her. So those three things, you can't go wrong, and please don't give up. Thank you for listening to our story. I would say um, dealing with bipolar disorder, one of my fears is um, having children, honestly. I um, went to the doctors and was just curious one day and asked them, what is the possibility of my child having a mental disorder? And she said, basically, they will. <laughs> that was scary for me because to I work with people with disabilities, but also have a child that I felt as though I'm damaging just be, just to have a child to basically affect their mind to one day deal with a disability I'm not sure if I want to deal with that and so being that have being that as a fear I know that that's something I can't worry about um, so I just I can't pressure the future I can't, I can't worry about the future you know so 
but it's a constant bother with me and so i really go around and I'll, I'll ask myself like okay i gotta find a very sane husband because <laughs> i don't want my children to have mental disabilities and i can't control that but it's something i think about in my mind you know but um and, and going forward with that i know women who have children and their children are perfectly fine and if and if they aren't fine i know people who have children with mis mental disabilities and physical dis dis disabilities and they work with it they they make it work and they don't love their children less because of what they have so um that's one of the things i really do fear and in going into the future <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Eugenia Dry and the disorders I have, I guess you could consider them like alphabet soup, <laughs> um, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, uh, what those disorders are and they started from something physical when I was a child. I had uh, what's called a lazy eye, I still have issues with my, um, my right eye that wanders every now and then. But what happens is I transpose letters, words, numbers. I get things mixed up in my mind. Um, and then they come out of my mouth that way. Um, so it, it's kind of an interesting um, disorder. Well, how I dealt with it in my day, because I'm just going to tell my age, I'm 52, they did not have special education. There were no diagnoses back then. But I knew something was wrong because I couldn't read, really read, till I was 13. And ironically, it's because the words got bigger. When the words were really small, that's when I had struggles of Saul was was and on was, uh, don't even tell me. I don't even know what it was. But anyway, my, my brain would, um, like I said, just mix up letters and numbers and things. Um, but how I dealt with it, I said, you know, as a child of God, I'm, I'm going to deal with this head on. So ironically, I went into journalism and I became uh, a newspaper editor, what they call a copy editor. And my job was to go through and edit writer's copy. And I knew I really had a disorder because I was in denial, <laughs> thinking I was being so brave, when one of my editors became very upset because I really messed up a story. I mean, I was going in there and editing like nobody's business, and I did not read back over it. So I realized in order to take control of this disorder, I had to really be careful in what I was doing, whether it was on a keyboard or whether I was speaking. But how I deal with it now is I actually decided to go into the field and to help other people. So the job that I have now is I'm a special education teacher and I'm a director at a Catholic school uh, called St. Augustine in Elk Ridge. And as a director there, what I do is I work with families and children of those families that the children have any number of disorders. They could be um, whatever their challenges are. It could be autism, it could be emotionally disturbance, it could be um, behavioral disorders. Whatever the case may be, I always tell the people that I work with to work from their strengths. And as you can see, sometimes I do slow down when I'm talking because I want to make sure it comes out right. Because <laughs> what I'm thinking is saying sometimes are two different things. But that's what I want to encourage everyone out there. If someone says that there's something that's not right with you, the Lord gives us all gifts. You can overcome anything through Christ. So when you take hold of that and you're not in denial of it, and you say, okay, Lord, with your help, I'm going to turn this around, he can, he can definitely turn things around for you. So you'll be like, well, how do I get paid for something that I don't do well, but I help others do well? and I can myself learn how to do better. And you can. Well, when you think about it in the Bible, there was a man named Moses. He couldn't speak very well. And the Lord knew that, but he made him the leader of his people. And he had his brother, Aaron, help him to speak. 
So just keep hope. Don't be disheartened. Be strong. And if you definitely, if you're strong in the Lord, it's going to be all right. So anytime anybody would like to talk to me and to also give me encouragement too, you know, I'm, I'm more than open to it. So I thank you for taking the time and God bless you and keep you.